Good afternoon. Welcome to The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazi. In our headlines today, Ghana finally launches the African uh, Continental Free Trade Area office here in Accra. President Ekofado was at that launch. We hear from him. Residents of Shashi who have been rendered homeless by a fire that has gutted their homes hit the streets on Rampage. And we're counting down to that premiere of Ghana's Greats, the story of the second president of the Fourth Republic of Ghana. All this and more coming up on The Pulse. I'm Daniel Darzi. Stay with us. Great to have you with us. My name is Daniel Dazin. Now, in our first story, Ghana has for decades chanted the slogan, The Gateway to West Africa, drawing attention to Western investors to head to Ghana once they set off to the sub-region. This afternoon, the country will not only be the gateway, but the destination, as President Ekofuado hands over the headquarters building for the African Continental Free Trade Area. And the opportunities are without measure as President Ekufad once again declared Ghana open for business. As part of the hosting agreement, Ghana was requested by the Assembly to work with the AU Commission to ensure an expeditious and efficient process of establishing a permanent secretariat for the AFCFTA in Accra. Ghana has fully discharged all her obligations and commitments agreed with the AU Commission. And we are today handing over a fully furnished and befitting office space in a secured and easily accessible location within the business center of Accra as the permanent secretariat of the AFCFTA. We have provided also an appropriate furnished residential accommodation as the official residence of the Secretary General of the AFCFTA. I have no doubt that the coming into being of the African Continental Free Trade Area is one of the most important decisions taken by the AU. When you consider the fact that trade be between African countries remains low, currently standing at some 16% of our combined GDP, compared to other parts of the world, like the European Union 75%, it is obvious that these very low levels of inter-regional trade constitute one of the defining characteristics of our continuing poverty. They hinder our prospects of bringing prosperity to our peoples. A last part of the growth in prosperity and prosperity that we seek on the continent will come from us trading more amongst ourselves. We now, Trade Minister Alan Tremanting has been detailing how Ghanaians can take advantage of their country's hosting of the AFCFTA headquarters in their country. Ghana has developed a national plan and program of action to harness the benefits of the AFCFTA. And this is based on seven clusters that were actually recommended by the heads of states of the African Union at the same time that they endorsed the establishment of the AFCFTA. Now, these seven uh, clusters include how we harness our productive capacity. It includes how we reorient our national trade policy to focus on taking advantage of the AFCFTA. Uh, one cluster deals with trade information. How do we identify the potential products that we can export to other countries? Um, it also deals with access to financing uh, for production and, and trading purposes. So these are seven clusters that would give us a full broom program that helps us now to enhance our capacity to take advantage of the AFCFTA. 
Now, shortly, we will be speaking to the executive director of the AFCFTA Policy Network on how you can take advantage of the hosting of the headquarters here and what it will mean broadly for the economy. We'll also hear from a labor economist on the impact this will have on Ghana's labor market before that. We can hear from the first general secretary of the free trade area and has been speaking about how they intend to use the base to expand trade on the continent. It is therefore natural that as we take this significant step towards the integration of the market in Africa, that the AFCFTA Secretariat is in Accra, Ghana, and that Ghana continues to be at the vanguard of integration in Africa. On behalf of all Africans, Your Excellency, Mr. President, I thank the people of Ghana, I thank the government of Ghana for providing world-class facilities that will enable Africa to progress towards the historic mission of achieving an integrated Africa. Right, let's make some more sense of this. Louis Yao Afol is Executive Director for AFCFTA Policy Network. Dr. Edu Oususa Akode, he's a lecturer of the Department of Economics, University of Ghana. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Let me begin with you, Louis. Help us understand for the layman what the AFCFTA is seeking to achieve in Africa. Foremost Look. is a common or single market and it's also seeking to boost into African trade. Boosting into African trade might means that now Africans can trade among themselves and there'll be a lot of exports. Um, the opportunities that will, will open markets now for us is that instead, if those who were not able to do a lot of volumes outside Africa because of a lot of trade barriers and limitations, now can trade among themselves and create more opportunities of job, conserve more costs, and rather expand in Africa. That is number one. Number two, the agreement has a lot of protocols that op opens up to startups, entrepreneurship, opens up also to skills development. Because if you take a protocol like trading services, there's a lot of opportunities in terms of the hospitality and in terms of the uh, 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 tourism industry, exchange of tourism, export of tourism services. And so that is what the, the agreement mm. is to do, create mm. more market and traffic and trade, boost mm. it more. And also the core of it is have tariff liberalization, 90% of tariffs taken off for all products, except 10% of sensitive and exclusive products. So the, I, I guess that will be the fulcrum of the AFCFTA, that all the tariffs will be taken off. So if someone wants to export from 90%. Ghana... 90%. 90%. So if someone wants to export from Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire, for instance, 90% of the tariffs are off now. 90% yes, has been negotiated, but the 10% is based upon sensitive and exclusive product, which has a list that member states are supposed to submit those lists of product they are not going to trade off. And those lists were supposed to have been, con uh, accept have been adopted in February. But unfortunately, most countries have not submitted that schedule list. Mm -hmm. And so that exactly fits into what you're asking. So if you're going to expose certain things to Cote d'Ivoire, and it doesn't fall within the 10% list of exclusive and sensitive, it's good to go. Now, Dr. Duosu Sarkodie, help us understand this a bit further, because if you study Africa's trade relations with the Western world and the Eastern world, we are more import dependent because we don't have the requisite manufacturing capacity locally. Without this manufacturing capacity, how can we take full advantage of this AFCFTA? Yeah, I think you are right. Um, if you look at the manufacturing capacity of about 18%, uh, it is really a problem that is confronting us. One of the issues that we have always been talking about is the export of raw materials or the export of uh, primary commodities. And then usually African countries have similar primary commodities, 
You can talk about cocoa between Ghana and Ivory Coast. You can talk about onions. You can talk about yam, etc., etc. So I agree with you. I mean, the Ricardian theory, the, the theoretical background for trade is that you export the, those that can easily produce and import those that you find it very expensive to produce. But if you find that you are not one, you are not adding value to your 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 produce two your manufacturing capacity is so low, and three, your neighboring countries are also exporting similar you know, primary commodities. That's, that's a major concern. And I think Honorable Chamantin mentioned that it gives us an opportunity for African countries to really look at their trade policies. So it is time for us to really look at the trade policies. Uh, I am a Ghanaian, so I'll be selfish here. Let's look at uh, the Ghana trade policies the items that we can identify, the things that we know that Ivory Coast or Burkina Faso or Mali may not be able to produce, but Ghana has that uh, absolute advantage and comparative advantage of producing them. Then we can make some headlines. So it is true that we need to deepen the manufacturing sector of our, of our economy. If this COVID-19 has not taught us anything at all, it has taught us how to be dependent, how to produce the things that we can easily produce them locally. Because now we are talking about trade, but currently as you speak, borders are closed. So, you know, there's every reason for us to restructure. This gives us an opportunity to reform, restructure our trade policies, our manufacturing sector, put the measures in place. I was happy that the president of the Republic met the bankers, uh, the banking association, and also the pharmaceutical industry. I, I'm sure he has also met other manufacturing uh, companies. The whole idea is to how these banks can make available finances right. to, you know, finance certain expenditure that goes into manufacturing. It is good that we have to deepen our manufacturing right. Uh, sector. Right. Uh, let me go back to Lewis with that point. Um, Dr. Sarkodie seems to agree that we must increase capacity. I heard you say distinctively how opportunities exist for startups and some businesses to get some support. Shed some more light on that for us. If I let me start with the countries, the countries have been grouped into three among the member states, Develop, developing a group of six lists. Ghana is among the developed economies among the member states. So they are going to trade tariff 90%. They're a group of six because it's going to be difficult for some of them to do that 90% to be progressive. And so Afrom Ezin Bank has provided the way forward for credit release for some of these uh, uh, small, small economies. In the same way, what will happen is that uh, I, uh, Doctor, Doctor made a very good point, and I think in terms of the banks, it's not even the government who is supposed to meet them. Public sector are also supposed to position themselves because the banks themselves fall under uh, the protocol called trading services, where they are supposed to uh, uh, export their their services in terms of financial services, insurance services to other member mem member states. And so, at the end of the day, uh, when we are talk about startups, what I'm saying is that Ghana has identified seven strategic way of implementing the connected future agreement. And if you look at the way it goes, uh, startups in certain areas, I remember after Exim Bank, Ghana export Exim Bank here has identified some areas within 2020 to really support. And so I'm sure that every year the bank keeps coming out with uh, major items of, of, of support for the industry. One area that is also going to do well is tech, tech technology, I mean tech startups. Mm. For tech startups, like Dr. Sako, they said, whether the borders are even closed or not, you can still be operating. And that has been something that is happening. I want to push this that if you remember, there have been a lot of virtual meetings for heads of state and what have you. And you can imagine the fiscal discipline that have uh, uh, accrued to most of the, uh, the, the economies. And so tech under trading services is still open. And that area should be really, really taken considerably serious. Now, when you look, um, Mr. Afo, when you look at how some more advanced economies treated their private sector and sort of shepherded them to success, you can talk about all these Asian economies and specific companies that have done well because of government support. Sino Hydro, which is coming through with, is, is, is a typical example of how China is helping a company there. Are we targeting any sectors or any industries 
to ensure that they deliver the growth and the jobs and the exports yes. that we need in a, in a definite it, it, number of years? Yes. I mean, the, it is the responsibility of member states themselves to identify how they're going to strategize under the uh, protocols. Phase, phase one has been negotiated. Phase two has not. Phase two is investment, intellectual property rights, and competition policy. Ghana, I know we don't have a, 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 competition policy, a competition law. And Ghana investment also needs a lot of review. Ghana investment policies are there, but you can imagine the issue that have been going on. And there's a bill that has been laid in parliament for a very long time. And I know for sure that the bill is waiting for the continental uh, negotiations to happen before Ghana can tap in from there to finalize its own. When phase two is done, it is going to help open up the sectors of most economies among member states. Nobody, it's going to be a fair playground. Nobody's going to bully anybody mm. because if you look at phase two investment, if you continue to hold back to protectionism practices, you're going to deny yourself of a lot of investment that are going to come in from other member states. Right. Already, automobile industry have already started showing the sign, the signs, and so it is imperative. Even the Secretary General even mentioned it. It is imperative that we look at some of these capital-intensive industries and do joint uh, um, um, operations or ventures. A critical example is the railway industry. Ghana mm -hmm. is having a kind of joint project with Burkina Faso, and I believe that when it ends in Burkina Faso, there will be another joint project to the place as far as Dakar to ease that infrastructure right. uh, gap. Right. Uh, let me wrap up finally with Dr. Du Osusa Kodier. How does the average businessman who is watching this at home take full advantage of the AFCFTA and its headquarters being cited here? Yeah, I, I think, yes, Ghana, I mean, Ghanaians must take advantage of the fact that we are hosting the Secretariat. The Secretariat's mandate is to implement the policies and also recruit, train personnel disseminate information, have conferences organized here. So for instance, if there, there's going to be a workshop or a conference here, the hotels in Ghana can take advantage. The tourism sites can also put, uh, project themselves uh, to, uh, to benefit from this. Uh, the media can take advantage of this. And then coming to the business itself, I mean, there are so many businesses, the security services, those who provide security for a secretari secretariat, the cleaning services, translators when during conferences. And then like I was saying the business itself, if I am a manufacturer or my business person and I want to do something, I think that we with the COVID, we had some Ghanaians complain that they were not able to import whatever they wanted to import. Now right. is the time to put their capital together, put their monies together, identify, get information about what can we produce to export to Mali to Kenya, to Ethiopia, that they don't have? What can we import from them to Ghana? How do we take advantage? So it's a, now is a time for all companies to undergo serious research. They undertake, undertake serious research. The R&D that we have been talking about in companies, now is the time for us to do serious research and development projects right. to identify the opportunities available so that we can take advantage of this and then you know make profits from it and then create jobs for the country now the end result of everything is to open the market grow businesses create jobs for a better well-being of Ghanaians and for that matter all africans dr hedo Sisakode, thank you very much before we let you go mr afo um what currency would we be trading in because you're speaking of 55 member states almost every one of them has their own currency so how do we regularize that? I think everybody, uh, is, as part of the agenda 23, uh, we'll be moving into one currency though, but for now, uh, everybody's going to use its own currency. However, payment systems have been developed, like the Pan-African payment system, to ease transfers among member states, which is very, very important. And also in terms of trade facilitation, uh, there have been an UNCTAD and AU developed complaint system whereby if you have issues with border issues, you complain against the member country that you are experiencing that. And within 48 hours, the member country is supposed to respond. Failure to do so, uh, they have a, limit, a name and shame kind of league. And so these are 
uh, ease financial services that have been put in place to support member states before we reach the one common currency. But if I understand what you're saying, this is totally democratized so that if I'm a businessman in Ghana and I want to deal in dollars with a businessman in Nigeria, nothing stops me. Um, it, this one has to do, it's not much of a forest, but it has to do with uh, currency denomination. Sometimes people have to suffer. It can be in Ghana, and I think the payment system allows you to trade within your local denomination to make transfer. I can give you a quick example of um, another uh, digital payment that has been developed, and I think Maslock is even running it here, whereby you can have any bank of your choice on that smartphone, and you key in on the bank of the, uh, the, the respected country, and then transactions about uh, pumps gives you the options, and then you trade. These are also options that have been opened up. But ultimately, this is down to the businessman. They choose how they want to trade. Yes, I mean, this has to do with those who we used to have issues of delays, bank transfer delays, and right. how to send money to their uh, receiving partners, and uh, you know maybe make advance payments and all those things. These are to right. take away that kind of the barrier, technical barriers, to allow that free flow. And Averizon Bank is also going to sponsor that project, and so it's going to be uh, that kind of uh, the repository among the uh, banks among Africa to be able to see how best. Uh, trading can be eased because it wasn't difficult. It was very difficult prior to this kind of payment system when somebody in Togo want to have a way of exchange that has been factored in. Personally, I think we need to have a time to have uh, to see how that payment system. Uh, I think time is short for us to go into right. the way uh, the payment system actually operates. Um, we must definitely find some time, Lewis, and have a further conversation about this. Lewis, our Afolis executive director for the AFCFTA Policy Network. Right, thank you as well, Dr. Um, Eduo Ususa Kodia, for joining us. You're still live on The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazin. Some health experts are doubting claims by President Ekufuado that his government's COVID-19 policies have resulted in a significant drop in active cases. In his 15th address to the nation, the president mentioned four out of the 16 regions Savannah, Upper East, Upper West, and Northeast are without any active case of COVID-19. But an epidemiologist and senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Medical School, Dr. Benedict Calistego, doubts this claim. We hear from him shortly. But before that, let's hear from the president. I indicated that a closer look at the data points to the fact that we are steadily on the path towards limiting and containing the virus and ultimately defeating it. And I requested all of us to pay particular attention to the number of active cases. As of 24th July, the number of active cases, i.e. persons with the virus, stood at 3,307. As of Saturday, 15th August, three weeks later, the number of active cases stands at 1,847. This is a clear indication that government policies are working. Currently, there are no recorded COVID-19 cases in the Northeast, Savannah, Upper East, and Upper West regions. And I charge their residents to do everything possible to maintain that situation. Greater Accra, Ashanti, Central, Eastern, and Western continue to be the regions with the highest number of active cases. Thus far, a total of 40,567 persons have recovered from the virus. This means our recovery rate has improved from 89.5% to 95.1% in three weeks. Our death rate continues massively to be low at 0.5%. Happily, there are no backlogs of tests at any of our testing centers. Now, Dr. Benedict Carlos Tego doubts this claim. He says the figures being churned out are not a true reflection of what's on the ground. We need to look at these pieces of information and the data carefully. It is one thing having data and another thing 
misinterpreting or misinterpreting the data. <clears throat> we have been testing for cases and picking up cases. Over the time, from the time we started this management, the number of testing is gradually declining. We are no longer doing aggressive testing as we used to do. Now, the number of active cases we have at any point in time is a direct product of our testing rates. If we are testing more and the disease is in the community, we will be picking up more. If we are testing more and the disease is not there, we would be picking up less. However, if we are testing less, it stands to reason that we would pick up less. So the number of active cases is just one side of the story. <clears throat> For any communicable disease, there are two groups of people you worry about as far as transmission is concerned. The active cases, those who have been diagnosed as having the diseases, that's one group. The second group are those who are asymptomatic, but still have the capacity to transmit this infection. We refer to them as carriers. For the active cases, we have identified them and we are in the position to implement our isolation measures and treat them. Mm -hmm. How about those we haven't identified? These are the ones we should be worried about. Bearing in mind that over 50% of even the diagnosed cases did not show any signs or symptoms. Okay. So the possibility that there are cases in the community which we are not picking up mm -hmm. cannot be ruled out. Okay, so what it is is that we should be treading cautiously or rejoicing cautiously exactly. when we say we that our are going down. very cautiously. Mm. And it will be erroneous for anybody to say four regions have no cases because we haven't tested everybody in those four regions. Okay. At best, what we can say is that for those who have been tested, no cases have been recorded. Our General Secretary of the Ghana Medical Association, Dr. Justice Yangson, wants the government to focus on the rigorous testing as the president initiates plans to open up the economy. We ease the restriction. We should be in a, in a position to test as many people as possible as and when they need to arise. For example, we are going to get the continuing students to go back to school, those in the tertiary institutions. These are huge numbers. Nobody is praying that they get infected in there. But in case there are any fallout, we should be in a position to do the same. Mm. As we eat other restrictions, conferences, what have you, what it means is that any time there is a need for us to test, and need to be able to test. Mind you, within the clinical setting, as we speak, we are still getting cases from the general community as well. And like we had discussed earlier, there is a need for some enhanced contact tracing and what have you for such issues. Okay. So what It's still live on The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazi. Let's take the latest figures as available on the Ghana Health Service website. 121 new cases, 1,847 active cases, down from 1,906. You want to look at the number of recoveries and discharges, 40,567. Confirmed cases. Now, this represents everyone who has tested positive in Ghana since the 2nd of March, 42,653. However, the eight more people have died. Eight more people have died, bringing the death toll to 239. May their souls rest in peace. You're still live on The Pulse with me, Daniel Jazzy. We'll be right back. And thanks for staying with us here on The Pulse. Now, the Accra Metropolitan Assembly, AMA, in collaboration with the Ministry of Sanitation and Water Resources, launched an initiative in January 2018 aimed at ending open defecation in the city. The initiative is to ensure every house has a toilet to help fight open defecation. Available statistics indicate that about one out of five Ghanaians defecate in the open. 
even though the project has yielded some results, there's still more to be done as some households are unable to meet their side of the agreement. Chief Executive Officer of Samalek Solutions, Samuel Jabba, has helped the Gun North uh, municipality attain the status of being open defecation free, a feat that needs to be applauded. He's trying to replicate this in every corner of the country to ensure each household is equipped with at least a toilet. Joining us in the studio is CEO of Samalek Solutions to tell us about the project to ensure open defecation a free status in the nearest future. Hi Samuel, how are you doing? I'm good. So tell us about the project. Okay, so so a correction is actually not the entire Ghana. Okay. It's about eight communities in, in Ghana. Which have been declared open, open defecation, defecation free. free. But okay. the target is to get the entire Ghana of open defecation free. And eventually the entire nation. Yes. Mm. Of course. I mean with with such high you know number of people practicing open defecation, you know. The, the, the aim is to get everybody on board so that everyone can access a household toilet. So what we did, actually there have been so many interventions that have been aimed at uh, getting toilets for households. But most of the time, the issue has to do with funds. The people don't have money to access the toilet. About 10, 15 years ago, you can talk about people who want to build a, toilet, a, house, a house without a toilet. Mm -hmm. But now it's changing. Mm. People have realized the need to get a toilet in their house. But again, the bottleneck is funds. So what we did was to approach this household and give them, find out how possible we can get them to access a toilet. And what we found out was interesting is that uh, these people have resources. They have wood, building materials that they can gather to put up their own building. So we, we approached Gamma and told them, look, we wanted them to pay 30% on the project, but they don't have the funds. Even at 30%, where they have to pay about 1,200 to assess a whole toilet, including the building and floor, a, a toilet with a floor tile and everything, they couldn't still raise that amount. So what we did was to engage them. We got them to put up their own toilet structures. Okay. We approached Gamma. Gamma came in to support us and we build this toilet for them. And it's interesting to go to these communities mm. and see people who have mud houses and actually have block uh, structured toilets. It's interesting. It's very interesting. Tell us some of the challenges you encountered in this project. You see, when we, we entered the community, what we found out was that there are so many households without toilet facilities. Open vacation is the order of the day. They either defecate in a uh, refuge dump site, uh, along the roadside, even classrooms. Mm. Yes, they are, these people don't have toilets in their homes. They don't have community toilets. So how, how then would they be able to dispose of their, their fecal matter? So when we approached them, we found out that the main challenge was funds. And there have been promises here and there, but nothing happening. So after engagement, we found out that there's, there's a way out. And the way out is getting them to put up their own toilet structures. Okay. And they came out. They came out to, 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 to accept this, this initiative. And, mm -hmm. and uh, if you go to the community now, every household has a toilet. So how can anyone at all, and I mean anyone, join the train to eradicate open defecation? I think it's about commitment. Mm. When I was trained back in 2013, mm -hmm. my aim was to get a household toilet for every house. In fact, an improved toilet. I believe there are people out there who are doing one or two things to help their community. But look, sanitation is a huge, it's a major challenge for us in, in, in this country. And I believe if we all come together, we all come on board to as, assist each other, we can we can attain the state of open defecation free. What I'm actually, um, what, I, what I'm here for, and what I want to encourage people there to come out and support this cause. We are, we, we are, we are, we are inviting corporate organizations, stakeholders, other stakeholders, government, and everyone who has the, 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 the nation at heart mm -hmm. to come on board and support us. How we can have, they support We have identified, identified 
so many communities that need these facilities. But they don't have the wherewithal. That's the point. Mm. So we, we want them to come on board. They are, they are people who have raised their structures, they have their, their uh, superstructures, they've raised their superstructure. they need these facilities. So we are talking to um, the corporate organizations to come on board and su support us. How so, can they contact you if they want to support? Well, they, they, we, have, uh, we are on Facebook, we have, we have a website which uh, they can contact. They can also contact us on this number, 0243 67 3937. Anytime you call us, we will we'll be available to call us. 0243 67 3937. Yes. Six seven three nine three seven. We'll put it at the bottom of the screen. Yes. Yes. And what sort of support are you looking for? So we are looking at companies coming on board and adopting this project as the their corporate social responsibilities. We are looking at people who will come on board to adopt a household or two households or ten households and and promise to provide them the facilities. How much does it cost to adopt one household? So so we've We've managed to, to, to bring down the cost, probably about between 1,000 to 1,005. You can adopt a, car, a household. That sounds like um, an affordable feat. Yes. Um, yes. All the best, Sam. Thank you very much. Any final words before you go? So what, what I want to tell everyone is that sanitation is a real deal. And in these times, people don't need to use shared toilets. You know, the COVID doesn't yeah. encourage people congregating at a particular place yeah. or using a shared uh, facility. So we are encouraging everyone to come on board, on board to accept, assist these vulnerable to get their own household touch. Thank Samuel you. Jabba, thank you so much. Thank He's you. the chief executive of Samalex, which is helping, which has helped eight communities in the Ganoth municipality to be open defecation free. So for 1,500 cities, you too can help one home become open defecation free. You can look for Sam Alex on our social media handles. Now, we want to move to other stories and dozens of homeless Shashi residents took to the streets this morning to register their displeasure with a recent fire outbreak. Now, according to the residents, media reportage have wrongly, wrongfully blamed them for the incident. This has affected their ability to gain the required aid as close to 600 of them are currently displaced. They told Joy News the main suspect of the fires has been peddling falsehoods, which they are unhappy with. Watch this. Those were scenes of a fire outbreak on Friday, the 14th of August, 2020. That's two days ago at this place, Shiashi in Accra. About 600 residents, or in fact occupants, we've been told, have been displaced following that some hundred stores, some business, some serving as homes, mostly makeshift structures, have been affected heavily by that fire outbreak. Hundreds more, like this bottle right here, were filled in this particular store. But today, thousands of Ghana cities have been lost across this very area. Many of them are angry. Many are also sad, appealing to government to come to their aid as their livelihoods, like this bottle here, has been destroyed. I'm Evelyn. Evelyn. I'm one. I stay at La Paz, but my shop is here. So they called on Friday around 10 that my mom's place is burning. So I rushed to my mom's place. It wasn't my mom's place, rather it was my shop. When I came, everything is bent. I don't know how it started, though, but I don't know what to say. I learned the lady was boiling water to go and bath, and she left the place and went to another friend to go and chat. So that's how we got it. And I'm a wholesaler too. So now I don't know. We don't know what the government is going to say, the MP is going to say. We don't know. What were you selling in the store? I was selling club, Guinness, everything, all types of drinks. So about how many crates are we talking about? Almost 600. 600 crates? Yes, 600. You see, some had drinks, some there's none. I sell uh, plastic drinks, I sell water, this Belacqua water, a lot of things, food drinks and other things. 
You can even see they are inside there. They are all bent. All the crates are bent. And how much you see this? Uh, are we talking about lost here? Estimate. I can't tell. It's getting to let's say eight thousand. Because they came and served me Thursday and Friday. The club came with a lot of goods. We've not even checked. You see, so I don't know. I don't know how to start and how to. Only the crate alone without the drink service, another thing. We buy the crate each 20 Ghana. Especially the Pepsi one is not for sale. But we, we try to get it even one. Even the Pepsi, how to get it is a problem. People bring it 40 Ghana each, 30. You have to break the company before they give you the Pepsi crates. And look at what has happened. Where am I going to start from? Where? Ah. It, it, it's really painful. Tell, tell us how much this um, affects you. Uh, is this your only A lot. business? Yes, that's the only business I do. Because those in the traffic come in to buy the active and the rush and the plus. So I used to bring a lot, then they take it. The following day they bring them. When they bring the money, then I call the car to come in, the truck to come and offload some. So that's how I do it for that side. You see, then they came on Friday to off some. So I don't know. I've not paid. Do you have children? Do you have any others depending on you? Yes, I have. No, I have one son. I have a son. I have a son. So I don't know. 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 I don't know what is happening. I don't have children. Two days after, on Monday morning, 17th of August 2020, when Joy News arrived here, many of the residents were angry, protesting fact the media reportage and the narration of incidents so far has not been fair to them, nor their welfare. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Yeah. 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 According to records, one Sandra, uh, uh, that's the only name they've been able to give, says one Sandra is directly um, implicit in this fires here. She's saying that most of the time when there is any help coming into the zone, most of them have been skewed to her and that they are angry here because of their losses. Yeah. Mira, yes, that was said. Media, a Johnny Bayan, Menene Boho, Sir Abayan, a common radio station for the set. Yam Buano say and do with Jana or Yano Cre. Na ye, and a sister way, Papa for Bebe. Na ye, and you say, ye betting me a do with Jano. Auntie, ye, Jana Chisama, Yania Menina, Ashi, a radio station for the Baya. I see a Jano Bayano or Flayano where we are not knowing, sir. Where you need me a ma. A quarter of the man is in the Tiasi. I know pay a buffoon. You are a buffoon, sir. Say, say, no. Press 
before. And I said, We buy ye. Oh, my dear, and I yet down. And why are sorry? And I'm going to be empty. I said, Because of us, I'm going to say, Ebi no more say, Yana yape, and I just say, and to all the other, I know, and 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 Oma ka wo UTV that's why to say yeah na ye pe e na de na se en kra adan ye ntimi han yo enye se it's a secure sma ye ye ni pa en kra adan board den enti ye ntimi han dan ti ne secure sma ye ye juma wo sorry a wo nya baby da wo sorry akwa di upa money do i fm this land does not belong to anybody hold on so i'm the land belongs to my uncle hold on so what's your name and do i'm now me i'm one okay i'm a resident here okay and i'm telling the whole session that we are in support when this thing came and this thing happened. Honorable Lydia came and helped us. John Domelo came. Uh, Professor Nadu Efenda. John, John Domelo came. Uh, Professor Ayete came. They are in charge of Presby. They came forward and they helped us. And we are grateful and Calvary Chapel and Pentecost and Agape. They came and helped us. We were in need. We were crying. Our children don't have dress to wear. We ourselves don't have dress to wear. We cried the whole day. So if one person can do this, and the person will get away with this, and the person will run away, the government should stand up. And I won't give up. They should let the girl come. They should investigate the land. They should investigate the fire. We want the truth to come to pass. They should investigate the fire so that we will know because they say she packed all her things. Okay, um, 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 hold on, hold on. Um, have you, have you, we've been, we've been told by the fire service that no, they were. No, they, they they're doing it subtle. And that some people have been invited to answer questions even today. Are you aware of any such investigation? No, 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 no. No. And, and, and based, based on your suspicions, based, hold on, hold, please hold on fast. Based on your suspicions, have you reported this Sandra woman to the police station? No. They said when the police came, they said they will handle it. So we kept quiet so that they can handle it for us. That's why we have kept quiet. So up to now, we haven't had it. Today, Monday, I thought they would come around. Today, Monday, they didn't come out. But it, it's been only. It, it, it's been, it's been it's been only two days and this is Monday morning. Look at my food. Look at my food yesterday. I borrow money to repair the dog. No money. Why? Not for tea. They haven't been given any food in the uh, the it's alive on the pulse with me, Daniel Daz. Now, students of the Ghana School of Hygiene have accused government of deceit and lack of transparency as they make demands for unpaid allowances due them since 2017. For the second time in two weeks, the students picketed at the premises of the Sanitation Ministry demanding the payments. Now, while in response, the ministry said it will constitute a committee to facilitate the release of the monies, the students went ahead to register their displeasure. Manuel Kranting was there. This is the second exercise in just about two weeks uh, from students of the School of Hygiene. Um, they are here just like they were just about a week ago and their request is for the allowances to be released to them. They tell me that for about 30 months since 2017 uh, when the new uh, government led by Akufuado took over and promised to uh, restore the uh, allowances to them, they have not for once received the allowances. They came here about a week ago and were told that uh, preparations were under which to release the funding to them. Uh, but they have come again 10 days down the lane uh, with the same request, meaning that um, the monies have not been released to them. A few of them are here, in fact, I'll be speaking to them and getting some reaction uh, from them. Their, their, their president, uh, thank you so much for, for coming. But why, why are you here again? You are about, you're here about um, a week ago, and then you are here again. What, what's happening? Okay, so um, last two weeks, Thursday, that was um, the seat of August. We were here, um, schools of hygiene Ghana. We, we have the three schools of hygiene, Hotemale and, and 
and Kolebu. We came to the Ministry of Sanitation um, as Nanado restored the um, health training allowance. The schools of hygiene have been ignored, neglected. For three good years now, we have not been paid. So we were here to also uh, mount pressure on the ministry to make sure that they pay our allowances to us. But we have interest in the allowance. That is why we are here today. And without a clearance today, we are not living here. We brought our gari, we brought our shito, we brought our mattresses, we brought our um, cylinder, even for cooking. We, we will cook here today. Well, I'll come back to you, but let me speak to a few of the uh, folks here. Um, the ladies who are here, all of them have decided to uh, come and sleep. Hello, good morning. Thank you uh, for sp speaking to us. And, um, quickly, well, let me come back and speak to a few of them here. Well, you are here again. It's about a week. You came here on set and decided to come back on, 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 on uh, today, 17th again. Why, why are you here? Please, we are just here for our money. That's all. We are just here for our money. And if, in fact, the money we are entitled to is, so we deserve it. But they say they are working on it. They say they are working on it. Why can't you wait? Oh, we can't wait because we've been waiting for three good years. So there's no more for waiting again. But the ministry says it is setting up a committee to facilitate the release of the funds. The ministry has decided that a committee be formed with you represented. That information has been given to your people. So now they are asking us to meet you and get your consent to be part of the committee. That's why I'm here. A committee to follow up the process leading to your... Okay, 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 okay. 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 No, are you prepared to be part of the committee? You see, we don't want a situation where today somebody will come and so I went here, had conflicting information. We want you to be part of the committee so that at each step on the way, you know what is happening. That is why I've been asked to come and meet you. Um, until when are you going to receive our allowances? Now we are not agreeing to anything. We are staying here. Now for the committee, our people will be part. Now let them go and bring our money because we are here. We are here not because of violence. We are here not because of violence. We are not listening to anything. We are here not because of violence. We are not going to make noise. We are not going to fight the police. We are not going to fight the ministry. But what, what you are telling the president that the president should direct the ministry. Now the ministry is trying to form a committee. So the committee, until when are we going to receive our money? It is simple as short. We want a financial class. And our people have been demonstrating and getting their uh, a class. But schools have had in three years now. Why? Until when? Our people will be part. Once you are waiting here, you are eating, you are cooking, you are sleeping here. You are not going to fight the police. It's as simple as that. Now we want to tell the ministry. Now, now we do not listen. Our people from home and Tamale, they will join us here. So that even the number will be more. Now if they can contain the pressure here. Because we, don't, we are not here for stories. We are not here for stories. That the committee will be formed. The committee, I don't know who won. I don't know what the committee is going to do. We give us our money. We are not going. Then we give us our money. Are we not citizens of this country? Are we not Kenyans? Why is that not listening to us? Why is that not coming to our head? We need our money. Then we give us our money. We need our money. We are not living here. If you want us to die, yes, we will die for you to see that we need our money. Why? The body of the body of the body Tamale and whole school of hygiene. I'm from Ho. We have colleagues here from Tamale. We have been here since, and our colleagues are there and they are writing exams. So the chief director should call the, the principals of the two schools of hygiene that they can't do that to us. We need our money. So if they are writing exams behind us, we will send them to court. Today we are not joking. We want our money. So they should bring our money to us. If it is tabletop, they should give it to us. We are taking it now. If it is the committee that is going to take three years again, we want it today. They should put it in sack. They should give it to us. We're going to disperse it among ourselves. We want our money. And this is your election headquarters here on the Pulse on Joy News. Former president and NDC's flag bearer John Dramani Mahama has begun a four-day tour of the Volta region. The former president is expected to meet with traditional rulers, opposition leaders, or opinion leaders, I should say, organized labor supporters, members, and activists 
of the NDC. Joe News is learning that Mr. Mahama will ride on his infrastructure development to court the support of the electorate in the Volta region. My colleague, Ivy Setsuji, has been following the president, has been following the former president, I should say. Now, Ivy, bring us up to speed on what the former president has been doing. Right, Ivy, bring us up to speed on what Mr. Mahama has been doing. Right, so the pictures, the videos you see are of the former president, John Dramani Mahama, um, in the Volta region. You can see him seated to his, well, now standing on his left hand side is um, Samuel Ofoso Ampofo, chairman of the party. Do Ajaho, former Speaker of Parliament, is standing on the other side, on, on his right hand side. And um, let's hear from John Dramani Mahama before we hear from Ivy. And then from the technical institute, they can continue into technical university and qualify as BTEC, as auto mechanic, as uh, uh, HND, whatever qualification they can get free of charge. Because it's not the secondary school grammar kind of education that will help us. What has made countries like Germany great is that most of their people are technical vocationally trained and so you find that you have a lot of middle level technicians uh, ivy is currently with the pre the former president's um convoy ivy what has mr mahama been doing hello right ivy if you can hear me what has mr mahama been doing okay so uh former president mahama has been visiting uh, some constituencies in the Volta region. He started from the northern constituency and currently he is in the central town constituency and then we'll be moving to uh, Sugarhofer and then the Amro and then Keta constituency. Now, he's been telling the people that the NPP is dividing Volta region or, uh, and then Ghanaians and that instead of uh, trying to unite Ghanaians, they, they are rather dividing them. They refer to the uh, just endless registration where uh, the MPP tries to uh, make sure that people from the voter region are labeled to police, and so they were not able to register. And that was a very bad idea by the NPP. So he is asking uh, voterians to vote massively for the NDC so that when he comes back to power, he can unite the party. He also promised the people of North Tongue that all the voters that they started. Uh, before the left power is going to continue with the project. He said that he is going to make sure that people who want to go to school and then the vocational school will go free of charge. They will not pay NAC. He is talking about jobs. He said his priority is to create jobs for the people. So, right. for example, he said he is going to create 250,000 jobs every year for the four years that he is going to be in power uh, for the people instead of uh, asking them or waiting on them to always ask government to do something that he's going to make sure that everything the Ghanaian residents, Ghanaians as a certain voters as uh, he's going to fulfill that. I mean, so he's did he, them the mandate. Did he say specifically how he would create these 250,000 jobs? Yeah, well, he, not specifically, but he said that by the technical and vocational skills, uh, uh, a lot of people will come out to uh, skills, uh, not only secondary school, that not necessarily sending your child to secondary school, but to spend your child to vocational and technical skills to learn the skills, university skills, uh, to have jobs. So that is what he is trying to do, to make free technical and vocational uh, education uh, for Ghanaians. I that says, so jobs for right. So the jobs will create will be created through technical and vocational education for these people to hire themselves. Yes. And other jobs, according to him, which he right. was so specific, other right. jobs will be created for Ghanaians. Thank you so much, Abi Setoji, for taking us through that. Um, expect more from 
the opposition NDC's trip in the Volta region. Now, the governing New Patriotic Party, NPP, has vowed to shrink votes of the NDC in the Volta region during the December polls. Volta region chairman of the party, Makafu Wanya, expressed optimism. This objective would be achieved if the NPP harnesses the right mindset, approach, and strategy during the campaign. He said this at the inauguration of the Volta Region Campaign Committee in Ho. Fred Kwame Asari reports. The 13 member committee would plan, coordinate, and execute campaign activities of the NPP in the Volta Region towards the December 7 polls. The committee was tasked to work towards increasing the governing party's voting pattern in the general elections. The national MPP organizer, Sami Ewuku, who inaugurated the committee, urged members to ensure the NPP wins parliamentary seats in the Volta region. So for the team today, their task is simple. Mobilize enough votes for candidate Nanado Dankwe Kufuado and his parliamentary candidates in the various constituencies. If you list Volta, we have zero seat. Your brothers and sisters in OT, they've exposed you temporarily. <laughs> but it's temporary because you have an opportunity to make a claim. If we move from zero in Upper West to five seats in 2016, it is possible to have more seats in the Volta region. He, however, implored electorates to vote based on their circumstances and developments harnessed in the region. Sometimes what saddens my heart is that the NDC only remembers voter region in an election year. Yeah, you're right. You cannot pretend to love a woman but only remember that woman in the middle of the night. That is disrespect to the woman. If you love the person, it should be morning to evening. It should be throughout the four years of your existence when you are in government. The eight years you were in government. But you never remember this, your adorable region. But when it was time, or when it's time for elections, that is when we remember that we have a covenant with this, our beautiful region. Now our eyes open. And clearly the people of Volta region they will decide where to cast their ballot and who to cast it for, depending on their circumstances and the development that has come their way. That should be the issues that will be confronting the people in the region with come this December 2020. The Volta Regional NPP Chairman, Makafi Wanya, who doubles as the chair of the campaign committee, assured the party would achieve its desired objectives. And I can tell you that with the right mind and approach and strategy will get to where we want to get to. Our agenda, our set objective will be achieved with the right approach. So I want to assure the national organizer and the national research and elections director that we are battle ready. There's no fears. Fred Kwame Asari, Joy News, who... Now, President Ekufuado has taken a swipe at his government's critics who oppose the compilation of a new voter register. Several civil society organizations as well as political parties, including the opposition NDC, kicked against the exercise, citing poor timing and the COVID pandemic. But in his 15th COVID-19 update... President Ekufado said his government's COVID-19 policies has resulted in a significant reduction in the number of active cases and had no negative impact on the exercise. While charging the police to deal with people who contributed to the isolated cases of violence at some centers, he described the exercise as largely peaceful. And there were those who claimed that in the midst of a pandemic, the registration exercise should not be conducted with some warning of an explosion in our case count and very high numbers of deaths should the exercise go ahead. By the grace of God, the work of the Electoral Commission 
and the effective measures put in place by government, these prophecies of doom did not materialize. There were nonetheless deeply regrettable isolated incidents of violence which I condemn unreservedly and which I expect the police to deal with without fear or favor. But the exercise was generally peaceful. The Ghanaian people have by the conduct of this exercise demonstrated our commitment once again to consolidating our status as a beacon of democracy on the continent and in the world. The professional Jeremiahs and naysayers who seek cynically to make a profitable industry out of spreading falsehoods, fear and panic, stoking divisive ethnic sentiments, underestimate the resolve and the determination of Ghanaians to build a united, democratic, peaceful, prosperous and happy Ghana. It's alive on the pulse with me, Daniel Das. Now, the need for relevant quality and timely information is very critical to sustain the fight against corruption in Ghana and help us in our nation building efforts. Now, to explore this subject further, the National Commission on Civic Education, with support from the European Union, brings you the seventh National Arab Dialogue on the team Rights to Information on Tuesday, 18th August 2020. With me in studio is Joyce Efutu, who is Director of Communications and Corporate Affairs. Good afternoon. Good Great afternoon, to see Daniel. you. Daniel, yes. It's so what while. is the Arab Dialogue? Okay. The um, NCC, we instituted a dialogue series since 2014. It is one of our civic engagement platforms where we engage the citizenry on democratic and uh, national pertinent issues. So for the Arab, in 2017, we had a partnership with Arab, and the Arab is an acronym. It means anti-corruption, rule of law, accountability, and environmental governance program. So we have engaged Ghanaians on several thematic areas, uh, including corruption, rule of law, environmental right. governance, and I think our fifth and sixth dialogues, we held it here on the coronavirus pandemic yeah. and then good environmental governance, yeah. that's proper disposal of PPEs, and how we can protect ourselves to contain the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. So where will the 7th be held? The 7th will be held in the Joy FM studios, Joy News, and then Joy FM will carry it live. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the coronavirus, we don't want to bring people together. Ideally, for our dialogues, we had people beyond 500 gathered in right. one venue where we bring the panelists and we discuss issues. But to help contain the spread, we don't need to mass people together and then educate. So we intend to hold it virtual. And, and what's I the think topic? Yeah, the topic is right to information. Mm. And right to information is critical, as you have said in your intro. I mean, we are always encouraging people to participate in the democratic uh, processes. And how can they participate? They need information to, in, in order to help in the fight against corruption. Because if there are things going on, you don't have the right information. You can't access information. How then do you blow the whistle or come up with other issues? So we thought it uh, uh, wise to as part of our educational activities, mm. to hold this uh, dialogue, to bring experts, those who have been in the forefront prior to the passage of the Rights Information Law Act 989, to come and then explain issues. For our dialogue, we intend to engage and empower Ghanaians and then so that they can also participate in the governance processes and also in the fight against corruption. Who are some of the experts who will be in the dialogue? Okay, we are looking at... Uh, Mrs. Linda Ufurukwafo, that's Executive Director, Ghana Integrity Initiative. We also have Mina Mensa, who's Director, Africa Office of Commonwealth Human, Human Rights Initiative. And we are looking at uh, MP and then the Chairman of the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee of Parliament. So they will be discussing uh, the right information processes. That's involved. Benson Abdallah. Yeah, that's Ben Abdallah. Ben Abdallah. Ben Abdallah Banda. Ben Abdalabanda. Yes, Honorable, sorry. Your South. Your Fintu South MP. And he's also the chairman of the Constitutional, Constitutional Legal, and, and and Legal and Parliamentary yeah. Affairs Committee of Parliament. And it will be moderated by Samson Ladia. Yes, the face of NCC. <laughs> Since we have been 
Uh, he has been moderating our dialogue series since 2014. Wow. Uh, yes, so he will be moderating, God willing, uh, tomorrow. Okay, what should the viewers and the listeners be looking out for? Yes, we want the viewers and listeners to tune in to Joy News and Enjoy FM from 10 a.m. tomorrow to 11.30 a.m. That's one and a half hours. And then they should be looking at the right information. They will explain the right information law, processes involved in the assessing information. You know, uh, if the information is urgent, it means you need to apply and then state reasons why it is urgent and it should be provided. If it is not urgent, you put in your application, you don't need to state uh, the reasons why you are applying, and even the state of implementation of the law. You know, the law was passed last year, mm -hmm. and we expect certain structures to be put in place for its implementation. So they will discuss all that, and then limitations to assessing information. And even, you know, these assemblies, they are supposed to publish their annual accounts for the information of the people at the local level. Are they doing that? Are they not? How can citizens ensure that they enforce that thing? So these are some of the things that tomorrow they should be looking up to when we bring our people together on the seventh, there's virtual Arab dialogue. So we'll have uh, some uh, panelists in studio, then some will also join via Zoom. Okay, so um, once again, the time is 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Yeah, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And right. our partner has been the European Union, and we also have the Arab Coordinating Unit. They have helped us in our Arab program since 2017 up to this year. Joyce Afusu, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Dazi, <laughs> for the opportunity you know, of being in your studio and also engaging Ghanaians. So the adults should be here tomorrow mm. from 10 to 11.30 a.m. As always, as always. Thank you so much. Uh, Joyce Afuso, of course, is Director of Communications at the National Commission for Civic Education. You're still live on The Pulse with me, Daniel Dazi. Now, damaged cars, unreasonable fares, and nasty flooding situations are only a few of the many nightmares that residents of Room 6 near Ashali Botri Lakeside Estate say they suffer as a result of deplorable roads. They told Joy News the horrible state of roads has persisted for more than two decades. They believe they are neglected by government as authorities are yet to act on the matter. PSA Nane of Safo has more. At first look, the lands beyond Lakeside Estate in Ashalibotri are perfectly normal, but a closer look reveals potholes in the roads which can best be described as mini craters. A drive in this part of town requires skill, extreme patience, and most importantly, one has to necessarily fasten their seat belt. The road ahead is a long dusty stretch. It is untarred with poor drainage on either side, and this has marred the otherwise beautiful community. So many years I've been praying for this road, more than more than 25 years. Any government comes, it goes. The road is just how it is. Stephen Ntie is a taxi driver here. Anytime they will say, oh, election, oh, election, you right to vote for them. But yes, still, our will see how it is. Our cars are all getting damaged. There's no one to help us. So my brother, if your people will help us alone, eh, we drive people, make people try. They get majority of their vote from this side. And see our situation. Must I see our situation? Every blessed day, you have to go to a workshop. Every blessed day, if you go for trips, one trip there for workshop. So you are not getting anything from this road. So you beg your people, you should try and help us. The government should come to our aid and help us. Because you are you pay taxes. Look, look, I did my insurance only yesterday. Look, I went and did my insurance only yesterday. I'm more than 4.8. And see the road I'm praying on it. See my road work, everything genuine. But we are not benefiting from the road. We are not benefiting. You the drivers there, I see the, the government haters. I see maybe you have taken the government in, 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 in wife or something of that. So you don't know. So you are losing a lot of money? Master, you are losing all our capitals. You are losing all our capitals. The, the only income that you get, you are sending all to the workshop. So you are not profiting. If you ask any driver on the road to even give you one million, I don't think he will get it for you. I don't think. Because all our money that is for the past. And right now they said the goods are not coming. So any pass is very costly. That's our problem. But he is not the only one. Adra Pukwa, a trader, has lived here for 17 years. She says the road has been in a dilapidated state and is calling on authorities to intervene. 
metena me ba me wo no ha kra sisi o okwo for ayi form tin o be tre exams e kwan di anya kra ntia ma kra ka kra enko last stop akra ka bi e be dru bi e gise kwa ha o ka se enko last stop enko da yesi kora virus aba e ma yare aba nti ye ni ye huni yesi estate ke ka estate di a ka neatness e na wo ho enso hwe estate na hwe ye ni a yesi ayi fan se o completed hwe de aya ha na hwe de aya ho na kwan ni de ye sramo sabo so be ma ye de ye mu hu ye mo bo na kwan ni nya kra e ma accident ko si aba saba saba sa ma traffic kra ba enso ka si bi ani ha enso to se ya wo ye hu hwe nya ye e ba wan ye le si se ko bra man fo nyina fie ti ye sra mo hu ye mo bo wai na na do ye sra na o hu ye mo bo on ka mo hu na mo ma ye kwan ni ma ye ye be to ama no so ama na nwini adua poku a is a um, she is a vendor here of yam produce plantings and many other food stuff she said indeed um, not only is the road situation uh, being as uh, very serious for drivers alone but it's also causing sanitation crisis uh, within she says he fought it several times they've spoken about it several times but it seems these matters keep reoccurring as a result also there have been several accidents uh, vehicular accidents on that particular stretch of the road she's reaching out to government and saying this is not a hate plea she they actually appreciate the government for its efforts but they are saying that for the vote to be secure the government has to act particularly on the roads right here at japan right under shalibutri the state of the road is taking a toll on the residents and many who plied their trade here. Osman Sharif, a water tanker transporter, says it takes him longer to distribute water because of the roads. I met down or met down almost seven years near Kawe de Yantishi. Yet you will be beyond Fangra. Obia of a couple will be a complainer about a quino. Yet Bresso, oh, a cut of a quino to be called Fun White or Asaba. Because the quining here, and tell me fast, I am a quine. But because to send a quarry, you know, your cars, as I say, one to a strap and pan, a strap and a strap and a two about, but empino, one like one shampoo, one my area from Pay Nimada, you know, into a strap and pan, or be a complainer about a quarry, or be a control through four, taxi four, private, or be a complainer about a quarry, or to a pan, watch up, mama, bansing to now, or more share quarry, my any more dear, and your crack, 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 to a strap and a strap and pan, a strap and. He has been driving here for the past seven years and he says the roads are in no better shape than when he started working here. As a matter of fact, this is not even his route. He was supposed to use the route down there, but due to how bad the roads are and how terrible they are, he has to use an alternate route in order to supply the water the tanks uh, behind me. He's calling on the leaders as he hasn't heard from them within the past seven years to step up and once again fix the roads. Officials of the Denton Municipal Assembly admit the roads need to be fixed in order to relieve residents of the agony they are faced with. Adentan MC Alexander Ninoy Edumwa says plans are underway to construct an ultramodern drain in the area. He explains why this must be done before rehabilitating the road. I mean, what's the point in putting a road there when coal tar and water do not mix? Water is coming from the top. The next rainy season, water will go under the coal tar that you have built, and then it comes off. And when it's been tarred before, the road has been tarred before, and the portals come, they are worse than when <laughs> they, they do not have the, uh, what do you call it, coal tar on them. But right now, if we do the drain, it means water coming from higher ground will just go into the drain. It won't spill over. So even if we put lactrite on the road and compact it very well, it will serve the purpose of a good the water will not cast. So what are the timelines for the construction of drains and roads? That's the question I put to Mr. Dumois. What I would say is that, yes, we are expecting that these things will be done because they've been packaged already. We do know, and I have met with the residents in that place. Maybe their expectations is that once they speak about it, now, tributes are pouring in for the longest-serving editor for the multimedia group Saeed Ali Yaqub, who passed on yesterday. Colleagues describe him as a man with an eye for talent. He was affectionately known by his colleagues as Alaji. But for those who worked closely with him at Love 99.5 FM in Kumasi, they simply called him the editor's editor. My name is Saeed Ali Yaqub. Saeed Ali Yaqub was born in 1963 in Jamase in the Shanti region. He had a secondary education at Edijen Senior High School, also in Jamase. And because of his love for reading,
He ended up at the Institute of Business Management and Journalism in 1997. Abwaje Frank Jackson was his classmate. Myself and Kofi Abidon Fair, like the one lady who is now a superintendent in the police service, her name is the superintendent who is in uh, Donko Gariba. We were always sitting behind the uh, Said Ali Yakub, mm -hmm. and he was always ready to give answers to questions being asked in class. I know. I must say that Said was always able to point out and correct the you know, mistakes of others with the brotherliness as it's supposed to be. Said is really a gem. After two years, Said was done with the journalism program. In the year 2000, he had opportunity to do his internship with Love FM and has since been with the multimedia group. Coming up in this morning's edition, government strategizes on ways to control fall army worm as planting season begins. Over the years, he has risen from being an intern to the news editor for Love FM and Israel FM. Uh, you remember situations where even after election results, journalists are attacked because one political party or the other has lost the election. Uh, you remember people can call on radio and, and attack people pe personally because of the work they do. Uh, the infamous Komla Dumo, you are a fool, uh, you know, rant is very, very fresh in, in our mind. In our mind. As a news editor, he would not only edit your work, he became a teacher who made sure anyone who came to the newsroom learned and became better. Multiple award-winning Joy FM said Kwame Boating, Elton John Brobe, Adum TV's Nanase Ampofoje, and Samson Ladi Ayenene, host of Newsfile, to mention but a few. In his post on Facebook, renowned lawyer and journalist Samson Ladi Ayenene wrote, I called him Doc Ali Ali, humble to a fault. I went to journalism school in his like newsroom, RIP. I was sent to Said's newsroom. The very first day he gave me an assignment to attend to, to cover and report on an issue at Asawasi. Then I did my report. He gave a complimentary remark after that. He sent me to do report after report. Look, what makes it a lot difficult to talk about is that just a couple of days ago, because of the eat, Said decided that he will parcel meat to some of us. We have a group of us that he has mentored. We call ourselves the squad. You know, so he parceled the meat by VIP to us and um, wrote our names. And he had just lost his mom. So we got together and put some stuff together which was to be presented to him yesterday. It was in the process of going to make the presentation that the news came that he's had to go to hospital. So the normal thinking was that, oh, this is just a one-off visit to the hospital, then he will come back, only to be It's all right, I, I'd rather not talk about it. Um. Said is, is a father to me. Somebody, if I go to Kumasi to work or to visit family, I first stop there, just go and tell him I am in town. I want to report myself because he must know that I'm in town. So we spoke at length, we discussed so many things and he told me, you continue to make me proud. Somebody I take advice from, I take direction from. Uh, no. 
Latif, he, he groomed me. He, I am Seth Kwame Watin today because God chose Saeed and you, Saeed, to make me who I am today. This one I was preparing to call and find out how he was doing. Just to be too, Saeed is gone. From journalism, he was a father, and not for only his two beautiful daughters, but everyone that passed through the new shoe. Listen to this. Bon for, bon pass away. The quadri of VIP. VIP. Eh, Saeed. And the Sumer. Saeed Ali Yakub. And now what is Sumer? It's Adan. And now we come on. And now, aha. Uh -huh. And I'm not one crane. Aha. Uh -huh. Eh, Samseladi. Set to come watch it. Elton Brube. Anna Afe, Emme, Ampo for ye, or the Namna Bafosi, Ababi, Bumadreni. That's a chin of Kuku. Say, say, Obi Adia, we are very bad. Tell it, and I'm not saying you are very new. Ebisa, Ebisa, and some see you, Obiana, like an idiot. Some see you, else in you, Media, would you, maybe the Kotomo. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. That was the kind of man Said Ali Yaqub was. He was selfless, he was loving, and wouldn't keep grudges against anybody. He was an example of being a team player. He would take criticisms from anybody at all, even the youngest person in the newsroom. He was an epitome of humility and service. Having worked for 19 years, he was one of the longest serving employees of the multimedia brand. But unfortunately, the cold hands of death has snatched him away from us. He was more than an angel on earth. Seized all copies of a number of newspapers would criticize the price rise. That's it for the business news. It drives bank. We didn't do other bank with us. My name is Said Ali Yakub. And we'll meet again. Rest in peace, Alaji Said Ali Yakub. The editor's editor. May Allah grant, grant him safe passage to Jannah. May his soul rest in perfect peace. This is um, The Pulse here on Joy News. My name is Daniel Dazi. <laughs> It's been a week since we started serving you European football fair. It's been back-to-back -back football from the Europa League quarterfinals right down to the Champions League quarterfinals. And then a break here, a break there. We are back with the semi-final. We had Manchester United yesterday crashing out um, against Sevilla for Sevilla to book their spot in the final. And today we have another one, Inter Milan versus Shakhtar Donetsk. We dive straight into... The preview with my colleague, Oriku Ampofo. Hi, Oriku. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Quickly, though, uh, we saw Man United play Sevilla yesterday. Should we expect more of the same end-to-end -end action today? I think so. I think so. And you look at Shakhtar, Donetsk, and how they do set up. They usually tend to attack very well, score lots of goals. Uh, you can see that from their track record in the Europa League this season. 
uh, for Inter Milan, they are also coming up as favourites tonight and uh, would be looking to try and unsettle their opponents. And uh, they have just one objective, and that's to win this trophy. And I'm sure that we should be uh, seeing another goal first, uh, depending on whether the teams do take their chances. But I do expect these two sides tonight to also open up and uh, play some quite enjoyable football tonight. Many people, to be fair, have not been following the Europa League as religiously as they do the Champions League. Give us a small idea of what Shakhtar and Inter bring to the table. I think for, for Inter Milan, uh, quite a number of people have had the chance to see them in the Italian Serie A. And uh, they've been a fantastic side. Unfortunately, they just missed out on the Serie A title by just a single point. Uh, but in terms of what they've done in Europe and the Europa League, remember that they qualified to the Europa League, courtesy finishing third place in their group uh, in the Champions League. Uh, they finished behind Barcelona and Dortmund, and due to that, had to drop off to the Europa League. And so they really do not have any choice because technically this is not their level. They fell from a, well, a way higher level in terms of the quality of football. And that's why I think that they deserve or they have to go for the title tonight. Uh, for how they play tonight, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's been good in terms of how they do play, and uh, they do score quite a number of goals. If you just look at their last two games that they went through before qualifying, they beat Wolfsburg 3-0, and then they also beat the opponent in the last, but um, the quarterfinal stage by four goals to one. So they do tend to score a lot. And uh, they do play very open football. Don't know how to defend. Love to score a lot of goals. Okay. So that will be tonight. Quick prediction. Literally two seconds for tonight before we go. Uh, when the draw you know, came out, I went two for seconds, Sevilla. Don't, don't talk a lot. Two seconds. Two seconds. Two seconds. Two seconds. Uh, I go for a Shakhtar. <laughs> he wants to upset the <laughs> Apple cards. And that's how... We call it um, a day for the sport. I'm Gary Al Smith. We'll be here tonight to let you know what the result is in that semi final. Stay with us on Twitter as well at Joy Sports GH, where we'll be having live updates. Thank you for your time. And thanks for staying with us from 3 p.m. till now. This has been The Pulse. My name is Daniel Dazit. This is where we draw curtains on the show. We'll be back tomorrow with another exciting bulletin.